after I did the connection moment, and just now I realized I forgot to turn my mic off. So if during the last song you heard a discordant fourth voice, <laughs> it wasn't Victoria, it wasn't Terrell, it wasn't even Jason, it was me. <laughs> Deepest apologies if that came through. I can't even remember how loud I was singing. But anyway, <clears throat> deepest thanks to the worship team for blessing us. This morning, as every morning, uh, what a gift, what a gift of service. Before I jump into today's sermon, let me give you a little bit of an update. Our church has never experienced a year like this one. None of us has our nation is in the midst of the worst health crisis in 100 years. And yet, most churches in Indiana have once again thrown their doors wide open as if we're not in the midst of a great pandemic. Here at Life Journey, we have felt called to take a more cautious approach. Out of love and concern for our congregation and out of a desire to help stem the spread of the virus in the broader community, to do our part as a church, as good citizens in a, church, in a broader community. That has been a hard decision, a real step of faith. Thank you for your patience, and thank you for your faithfulness. During the first six months of coronavirus, we experienced zero decline in our giving here at Life Journey Church. That, that is amazing. In the last two months, though, we have noticed a decline. It's dropped significantly about $1,000 a week leaving us about 11% below budget. Now, that's perfectly understandable in a time like this when so many people are hard hit financially. But it also happens to hit at a time when we're experiencing as a church special COVID-related expenses that aren't normally part of the budget, like purchasing a, a, a battery of high-quality air filters uh, for the building and uh, all of the safety supplies, uh, a, uh, a disinfecting fogger and uh, sanitary wipes and uh, disinfecting soap. And this past week, we significantly upgraded our live stream system, and we hope thereby stabilized it. This past week, we connected to a high-speed fiber optic cable that we brought into the building. Uh, previously, we could upload about 20 megabits per second as we were doing our live stream. With this new cable, we can now upload 1,000 megabits per second. So that ought to make a difference, right? Because we're absolutely determined to have the best possible live cast because that's what is keeping so many of us able to participate and be one together during this time. We also this past week uh, put in an upgraded router and we're working with an net, IT network expert to help us analyze from the camera to the cable that, that, that comes into the building. Do we have any other bottlenecks in our internal system so that we can eliminate those? So we're going out of our way to make sure that that's as best as it possibly can be. I hope it's functioning beautifully uh, this morning. On top of that, back when COVID first hit, we launched our Lowe's and Fishes program to make sure that nobody in our congregation was going to experience food scarcity during coronavirus. That program has been going beautifully, feeding not just congregants in need, but also people beyond our church. On top of that, we're maintaining our financial support for our partners in fighting homelessness, the, uh, the Family Promise Organization, and Day Spring Center for Homeless Families. We just yesterday mailed off to Honduras gifts 
Christmas gifts for 25 Honduran orphans. Thank you to those of you who participated in that process. Those kids are going to be so excited come Christmas morning. And we'll show you some pictures like we did last year once they received their gifts. We also are maintaining our commitment to support the girls' school in South Sudan and scholarships for boys and girls to get their education in Guatemala. We are determined we will keep those commitments come hell or high water. So I've been finding myself thinking, how are we going to keep all of this in balance? And that's when Jesus' words came to my mind, ask and you will receive. If you keep it a secret, Jeff, nobody will know that we need help. So for the next couple weeks, we're going to launch a brief stewardship campaign. This appeal is not to anyone who's experiencing financial hardship during coronavirus. This appeal is for those of us who are doing okay financially during coronavirus. Here's the ask. If you're not yet a regular giver to our church, but you believe in what God is doing through this congregation, now would be a great time to start a regular electronic giving account in any amount. And for those of us who are already regular givers, if our situation permits, now would be a great time to somewhat increase our giving. There's a famous story in the Bible about a a widow who, in a time of famine, made a bold decision to share her food. Each morning, she would get up and look in her jar of grain and her jar of oil and discover that they had been miraculously replenished. Imagine what that miracle of sufficiency might look like in our church. If you can be part of that miracle, go to lifejourney.church links and click on the button near the top there that says COVID miracle response form and that will lay out the options for you. God is greater than this crisis. Let's keep God's work through this church surging forward, especially in this time of great need. But now, Let's turn our attention to today's sermon. As Pastor Chris mentioned earlier, as we're moving toward Thanksgiving, we're going to focus for the next couple weeks on living a life of gratitude because we know that grateful people are happy people. Let's start with prayer. God, thank you for all you have given us. Life, laughter, Beloved family, beautiful friends, Jesus, salvation, spiritual hope, a light that shines within us, even in darkness, the light of your presence. Today, give each one of us insights that will help us deepen our sense of gratitude. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So here's a question for you. What is something about yourself that makes you feel superior? Now, don't be bashful. We all have certain strengths, right? So what is one of your strengths? If you're participating on Facebook, then If you want, go ahead and share one of your strengths in the comment stream. For those of us who are here in the sanctuary, somebody tell me, what is one of your strengths? Just call it out. A great driver. Yeah, we need more of those. (laughs) Somebody else, a great strength of yours. Organization. Organization, what a gift. Somebody else? Good listener. Good listener. Thank God. For good listeners. One of my strengths is tenacity. When other people are ready to give up, I have only just begun. I 
don't quit. Just ask those who have to play basketball with me. When my team loses, it's never over. We've got to play again because every strength can also become a weakness, right? Tenacity can easily become stubbornness or stuckness, but that's another story. Now let's turn the question around. What is something about yourself that makes you feel inferior? A weakness of yours. Somebody call out. What's a weakness of yours? Worry. Worry. I'm with you. Stuttering. Stuttering. Impatience. Impatience. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> One of my weaknesses is social insecurity. When I'm up here on the platform, I'm fine. When I'm among my church family, I'm fine. But put me in a room full of strangers at a dinner party and tell me to circulate and make small talk, and I would rather go eat horse hooey. Anything to not have to be in that situation. Social insecurity. We all have strengths. We all have weaknesses. We're all constantly evaluating ourselves and comparing and contrasting ourselves to others, judging ourselves and judging other people. Some people we like and some people we don't like. Some people we both love and hate at the same time. For example, who is your favorite golden girl? Of the four Golden Girls, which one is your favorite? Let's take a little poll. We'll, we'll take a little poll so that this is scientific. How many say, my favorite Golden Girl is Dorothy? Raise your hand. Poor Dorothy. Okay. All right. How many would say it is Sophia? Oh, boy. Poor Sophia. <laughs> How many would say Rose? Not bad. Not bad. How many say Blanche? Oh, a lot of sluts in this congregation, huh? <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't very pastoral. I have to tell you that Dorothy gets on my nerves. She thinks she knows everything. My favorite golden girl is Rose. She's humble. She's nice. What's not to like about that, right? Wherever we go. Whatever we do, we've got this thing that goes on inside us where we're judging and evaluate, com comparing and contrasting ourselves to others and others to others. That's what today's scripture passage is about. The Apostle Paul in the first epistle to the Corinthians is writing to them to address a, an issue of judgmentalism that was occurring in that church. He begins the conversation with these words, 1 Corinthians 3, 4, when one of you says, I belong to Paul, that's himself, and another says, I belong to Apollos, a different leader in the Corinthian church. Are you not merely human? What is Apollos then? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Paul, on his missionary journeys, planted the Corinthian church. After it was up and running, he continued with his missionary journeys while staying in close contact through occasional letters and visits. Meanwhile, the church needed a, an on-site, ongoing leader, and Apollos was appointed to that role. So the Corinthian church had two key spiritual leaders, the apostle Paul, the planter, and Apollos, the ongoing lead pastor. Apparently, people in the Corinthian church were judging and comparing the two of them, saying things like, you know, that Paul, he really gets under my skin. He thinks he, he's like Dorothy. He thinks he knows everything. Well, somebody else would say, what do you mean? I just love Paul's analytical gifts. Somebody else might say, that Opalus, he thinks he's the gift to the world. He's the oratorical gift to the world. Somebody else might say, what do you mean? Apollos' words really move me. So Paul steps in through this letter and says, Neither of us is any better than the other. God is working in and through both of us 
in different ways. Both of us standing together are better than either of us would be on our own. Then Paul seeks to broaden the conversation, not just to judging Paul and Apollos, but our tendency to judge other people as well. In chapter 4, verse 6, he says, I've applied all this to Apollos and myself for your benefit, brothers and sisters, so that none of you will be puffed up in favor of any one against another. In other words, Paul's saying, what you're doing to me and Apollos, you shouldn't do to anybody in your life. All of these petty judgments, we've got to get beyond it. We've got to stop being so hard on each other. Then, what Paul says next stops me in my tracks. Our key verse, 1 Corinthians 4, 7, the focus of today's sermon. You may have never heard of this verse before, but internalize what Paul says next, and it will transform the way you see yourself and the people around you. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as if it were not a gift? How would you answer Paul's first question there? Who makes you different from anyone else? Answer, God. God in heaven, the master artist, meticulously shapes and designs us using the raw materials of DNA and formative life experiences, nature and nurture. God, the master artist, intricately designs and forms each one of us. It's like the little girl who was wanting to pray the Lord's Prayer, but didn't remember it exactly right. You know how the Lord's prayer begins, our Father who art in heaven. Instead, the little girl prayed, our Father who does art in heaven. <laughs> Not a bad mistake, actually, because God is the master artist who uses formative life experiences and DNA and shapes and forms each one of us as unique as a snowflake. Every good thing about you is something you have received as opposed to earning, deserving. There's not one good thing about you that you have not received as a gift. The Bible says, James 1, 17, every good gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. For example, one of my gifts is words. I can get up here and talk pretty good. It comes kind of natural to me. But guess what? I cannot look back through my life and find any time in my life where I chose that gift. It has always been innate. When I was a kid, I would go to church and I would hear sermons. And when I heard a particularly good sermon, I'd put down one or two dollars and get that sermon tape. And I would take it home and put it in my tape recorder. And I would fall asleep at night listening to these sermons over and over again because I was fascinated with how God's Spirit could use words to move us and mold and shape us. It, it's weird. It's different. It's unique. It's just who I was even as a kid. And then I would hear these press conferences on TV, reporters asking tough questions to our leaders and our leaders giving responses, and that fascinated me. So as a kid, I would go into my room and close the door and hold an imaginary press conference. I know, this is really weird, I know. But I would, I'd, I'd have, I, I imagined that I was the mayor of San Antonio, Texas. I don't know why just because it was a faraway, exotic-sounding place. I was the mayor of San Antonio, Texas, and I would articulate the reporter's imaginary questions, and then I would articulate my imaginary response. So while other boys in the neighborhood were out playing and learning how to make farting sounds with their armpits, 
I was in my room holding press conferences. <laughs> Pathetic. But it's just who I've always been. Words were a gift. Jeff, you may say, you're selling yourself short. Because it probably required a lot of work, a lot of study, a lot of application in school to develop that gift of words. Yeah, it did. I worked really hard in school. I took speech classes in school. But step back and ask, where did the impulse to work hard in school come from? I didn't choose it. Some combination of DNA and formative life experiences caused me to really apply myself in school. It's not something I chose. My older sister and I come from the same DNA pool and share many of the same formative life experiences. We could not be more different in our gift mix. If you were to meet my sister Melody, you would discover she's much more charming than I am. If you are going to hold a dinner party, invite my sister, not me. She'll be the life of the party. To her, school was a chance to party. <laughs> to me, school was bear down and study. Two completely different people. Our DNA, very similar, tweaked a little bit, no doubt, by God. And our formative experiences, very similar, but somewhat different. And just those little tweaks by God create two very different people with two very different gift mixes. What do you have that you have not received in one way or another? And guess what? The reverse is also true. The things that you're not good at, the things that you don't do well, that's not your fault. It's not because you're defective or lazy or didn't apply yourself. If you were bored in school, it's because God didn't plan for you to be an academic. God gave you a different gift mix. If you are painfully shy, it's not because you're defective. It's because God did not intend for you to be a socialite. God gave you a different gift mix. That's why we need each other. None of us is sufficient in and of ourselves. All of us bring wonderful gifts to the table, but none of us brings everything that is needed to the table. We are all differently abled. I give thanks for the gifts God's given me. I give thanks for the gifts God's given you. And you. And you. Because together, we're special. This is the principal point that Paul is trying to drive home in our key verse. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. And when we really begin to internalize that verse, it ought to change how we see ourselves and others. It ought to change how we see life it seems to me in at least three concrete ways. In the little bit of time we've got left, let's quickly go through those three ways. The truth of 1 Corinthians 4, 7, everything is a gift that you have received. How that truth ought to change the way we see ourselves and others. First insight we can draw from 1 Corinthians 4, 7 is... Instead of focusing on what you haven't been given, focus on what you have and give thanks for that. If you've been around this church very long, you know that one of my favorite stories is told by Nancy Ortberg when early in her career she spent 10 years as a nurse. She tells how one of her first patients as a nurse was a 14-year-old teenage girl seriously injured in a dirt bike accident. Nancy says, before I went down to the physical therapy room to meet this new patient, I pulled her charts and looked at them and realized, was stunned to realize, that the doctors had had to amputate this girl's right leg from the knee down. Nancy says, I remember thinking to myself, I am about to encounter an emotionally devastated teenager. 
So she braced herself, walked into the therapy room. This teenage girl was sitting in the Whirlpool bath at the time. So Nancy walked up to the Whirlpool, introduced herself, began getting to know her, talking about her case. Nancy says, all of a sudden in the conversation, this 14-year-old suddenly lifted her wounded leg up out of the water, showed it to Nancy, and said, look how much I have left. The teenager went on to explain that the doctors had told her that it was fortunate that they were able to amputate below the knee instead of above the knee because it would be much easier now to fit her with a prosthesis. And the teenager wanted to know from Nancy how soon her wound would be healed so that she could get fitted for that prosthesis and get on with life. Nancy says it's not like she was in denial. She understood what she was up against, but this was a young woman who had made a decision. I'm not going to focus on what I've lost, what I don't have. I'm going to focus on what I do have. Nancy says, I don't remember much of the rest of the conversation because I was so arrested by that statement. Look how much I have left. God has given all of us wonderful gifts, aptitudes, abilities, life lessons, experiences, opportunities. Instead of focusing on what you don't have. Focus on what you do and give thanks for that. How's that? You, you may have heard that old hymn that says, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Is your glass half empty or half full? Nobody has everything, but everybody has something wonderful. Focus on that. First insight. Second insight, I want you to think about somebody in your life that you spend lots of time with? What is something that they don't do well? Something that they're not good at or something they do that causes you to think, why are they that way? Why can't they be more like me? Given what we've talked about in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, what's the answer to those questions? Why do you have to be that way? Why can't you be more like me? Answer, because it hasn't been given to me to be that way. You have your gifts, I have my gifts. We all have our own unique gift mix. I deserve no special credit for the gifts that I have, and I deserve no special blame for the gifts that I don't have. We've got to stop judging people around us for not having the same gifts as we do. The Bible puts it this way in Romans 14.4. Who are you to pass judgment on the servants of another? It is before their own master that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Uh, I know this will probably come as a shock to you, but I am something of a yard snob. I am manic and meticulous about how I keep our yard, to the point that I refuse to use a weed whacker to trim the edges of our yard because you can get a much neater trim with household hand scissors. You laugh, but would you use a weed whacker to trim your hair? Then why would you use a weed whacker to trim your grass if you want a neat, precise cut? Like a barber, you use shears. Anyway. I'm something of a yard snob. And so when I'm out walking our dog Lucy around our neighborhood, I just can't help but be judging the yards throughout our neighborhood, you know? 
who's beautifying the neighborhood and who's dragging us down. There is this house three blocks from us, sits on a corner, a prominent corner, where they rarely touch their yard. Sometime years ago, they planted a rose garden. There are roses there, but there are lots of weeds. Would it kill them to pull a few weeds? They got a rose garden right on the corner like they want everybody to see it. And they never pull a weed. They are irregular in mowing their grass and they've got lots of dandelions. Why wouldn't they hire a lawn service to get rid of those dandelions? They've got branches on their trees that are growing out into the sidewalk. So as you're walking past their house, unless you leave the sidewalk, you have to duck down like this to get past. Would it kill them to get a pruner out and just cut a few of those limbs? Then one day, as I was doubled over walking past their house, thinking how bad these people were in breaching the social compact. For the first, uh, yeah, I'm a piece of work, I know. We all are, we all are. I'm just being honest. For the first time, I saw the owners of this house. They happened to be walking out the door as I was passing by. She is elderly. And she was helping her obviously handicapped husband get from the door down a difficult couple steps and to the vehicle. And all of a sudden, I realized there's nobody in this house who can pull weeds. There's nobody in this house who can prune the trees. And on their fixed income, they no doubt can't afford a lawn service. So all of a sudden, instead of, what's wrong with these neighbors? It was compassion. If I were in their shoes, I'd be in the same place. And it was gratitude that I still have enough good health and I still have enough income stream that I can keep my yard the way I like it. So that instead of judging, it now became an opportunity and is each time I walk past an opportunity to feel compassion and pray for them and to be grateful for the gifts I have received through no merit of my own. Because someday my yard may well look just like that. This is the second key insight. Let's put it this way. Every temptation to judge someone for their inadequacies can be turned into an opportunity to practice compassion for what life hasn't given them and gratitude for what it has given you. So the next time you are tempted to judge your spouse, to judge a family member, a friend or a neighbor or a co-worker, I want you to stop and try to turn it around. Let's get in the habit of practicing that. Because what they don't have isn't a choice they made. And what you do have is not something you earned. It's a gift. Compassion, gratitude. Jeff, you may say, I hear what you're saying, but it's making me a little uncomfortable. Because it sounds like what you're saying is we never have the right to hold the people around us accountable. And they never have the right to hold us accountable. That it's all a given. It sounds like what you're saying is if somebody in my life is falling short, I don't ever have the right to critique them. No, that's not the point. That brings us to our final insight. Think about it this way. When someone in your life falls short, realize that you may be the next gift God is trying to give them to lift them higher, to help them get better. So instead of getting all judgmental and frustrated, which does no good, respond as if you are a gift with encouragement and compassion. The point is not that we shouldn't hold people accountable. It's all in how we go about it. Let me close with a, a story that hopefully illustrates the point. Uh, Paul Tripp tells how a number of years ago he gave his teenage son permission to 
uh, spend the weekend at a friend's house. Midway through the weekend, Paul gets a call from the mother of the friend of Paul's son, where Paul's son was supposed to be spending the weekend. The mother telling Paul that her son, uh, his son, never showed up. Her son started feeling guilty covering for his son and confessed to his mom, and she made the difficult call to Paul to tell him, we don't know where your son is. When Paul hung up, he said, I was furious. He said, as I was telling my wife, can you believe what he's done? This, blah, blah. He said, my wife said to me, Paul, you should pray. He said, I'm sorry, but I don't feel like praying for him right now. She said, no, I don't mean pray for him. I mean, you should pray for you. So taking that to heart, he went to the bedroom and started to pray. He said, as I prayed, I began finding myself thinking about noticing, struck by how God's work, how God's love was already at work in my son's life, trying to bring him back to where he needed to be. He says, it occurred to me that it was a gift of God's grace that caused my son's friend to feel guilty enough to confess to his mom. And it was a gift of God's grace that caused that mom to summon the courage to make that difficult phone call. And he said, I realized it was a gift of God's grace that I was having time to settle down and think this through before being face to face with my son. And as I thought about that, Paul said, I found myself thinking, I want to be part of God's gracious work in my son's life. So when his son came home, he says, I let him settle in for a couple hours. And then Paul said to his son, can we talk? The exact way Jesus interacted with Simon the Pharisee in last week's gospel passage. Can we talk? They sat down in his son's bedroom, and Paul said, son, do you ever think about how God's love is at work in your life? Sometimes, he says. Paul says, do you ever think about how God's grace is at work in your life in detailed ways? He said, my son just stared at me like, where are we going with this? Paul said, have you thought about how God's grace is at work in your life in detail? Even this weekend, Paul's son said, who told you? <laughs> Paul said, son, you have been a good kid. You've made lots of good choices. You've been easy to raise. But this weekend, you took a step toward the darkness. You can live that way if you want to. You can lie and deceive. You can use your friends as cover. You can choose to go deeper into the darkness, but I hope you won't. I'm pleading with you. Don't live in the darkness. Live in the light. With that, Paul got up and turned to leave, only to hear his son say, wait, dad, don't go. Paul says, I turned around and I saw tears in my son's eyes. And his son said to him, I don't want to live in the darkness. I want to live in the light, but it's hard. Will you help me? You may be the gift that's missing in somebody's life. Depending on how you respond, God could use you as a gift that helps someone overcome a failure, or a weakness in their life. It's not that we shouldn't hold people accountable. It's that we should do so with encouragement and compassion, not judgment and frustration, which does no good. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 calls us to see the world in a new way. Who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as if it were not a gift? Freely you have received, Jesus said. Freely give. Amen. Amen.